Open your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. The last couple of weeks have been brutal, <laughs> haven't they? I don't know if any one of you have been offended. I, I think there's potential maybe for uh, you to be offended if I mentioned one of your favorite worship groups or a church group maybe that you liked. And um, The topic of, of, of false teachers is difficult because um, it includes those who are heretics and then those who are kind of leaning that way. Sometimes as we look at the broader you know, Christian culture and what's going on, and we need to be warned. Um, that's Peter's purpose in writing to the church. He wants the church to be aware there's false teachers out there. We need to know what they look like. Today, it's, the tone is thankfully a little bit lighter. In some ways, it's a little bit lighter. It's, it's certainly... Uh, more hopeful at the end. Uh, but he's answering one of the questions that, that we hear and maybe even have at times. Like I, I think about some of the things that are going on in the world today, even like what's just happened recently locally. It's like, Lord, why are you delaying? Right, I'm, do you ask that question? I think sometimes it's, it's okay. It's okay to have that question. Now, I think that the culture, as we'll see, the culture asked that question, but in a different way. They do it in kind of a more mocking way because they're not believers. And that's what we see today. Peter is going to answer that question. And it's the most wonderful answer we could imagine. Let's read. We're just going to look at today the first uh, nine verses of chapter 3. Peter writes, This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you in which I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the word spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord... One day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. He lays out His purpose right at the beginning. I'm, I'm writing... Here now, this second letter, I'm writing to stir up your mind by way of reminder. There's things that you need to remember. There's things that you need to know. At different times, there's different things that we need to be reminded of, right? And there's, different, there's different thoughts and different doctrines that at times, it's like, oh yeah, I, I, I need to be reminded of that thing. Sometimes it's a responsibility. Sometimes it's a, it's a great, great hope that we have, a great promise. Like I said earlier, over the last couple of years, I, I have felt this very strongly. That the church of Jesus Christ, we need to be reminded who we are. 
who we are and what our purpose is. Probably all of us, to some degree or another, need to be reminded of that purpose. Why are we here? What are we, what are we supposed to be involved in doing? He wants us to be thinking about God's purpose in the world. In the first letter, he wrote to encourage the church in the face of persecution. Right? That was the, the main thing. Hey, hey, there's persecution happening. There's greater persecution to come. Be ready for it. Shouldn't be a surprise to you. That applies to us. Right? The, the persecution that was happening then is happening now. It's going to increase. The second letter has to do with false teachers. It has to do with false teachers, and the backdrop of the letter has to do with his own departure. He knows he's going to die. He obviously doesn't know the details of it, but he senses that, that, that the heat is getting greater. He knows he's going to be killed. And so his concern is for the church after his departure. He wants this reminder to be written down, to be, to be available to them, and to some degree, have it ringing in their ears. I say amen to that. It, he wants us to, to keep these things in mind. He has the false teachers on his mind. He's told us, he's told us, as we saw all through chapter 2, he's told us what they look like, what their motives are. You know, we, we've got that, you know, hopefully we've got that down. Now he's going to talk about here one of the issues, one of the things that comes out of the false teaching. And I think this kind of crosses over. It could be that within the church that some of these guys have either forgotten or, or they're misrepresenting the Lord's coming, or it's this idea that's in the culture that just mocks the whole idea. Either way, what he, he shows us is this is important. It's essential. This is what, what Paul calls our blessed hope. I love that phrase. We have a blessed hope in Jesus. As he's writing to Titus, Titus 2, 11 and 12, he says, The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Amen. The grace of God has come. Jesus Christ has come. We're, we're, we worship him. We celebrate him. He goes on. He says, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Are you, do, you, do you hold on to that? I, I, I'd say that is the answer to everything that's going on today. Like, like in regard to the things that, that you would otherwise get depressed about or that you would otherwise get distracted or, or, or overly concerned about. We have a blessed hope. Jesus Christ is coming. Even right at the door. He appeals, I love this, he appeals to what he calls their sincere mind. He says, I'm stirring up your sincere mind. Mind by way of reminder. How gracious is that? How kind? How, how sweet is that? He's not saying, okay, you idiots. Right? I think sometimes that's the way. Some, I hope I never come off that way. But sometimes that, maybe sometimes we need to hear it that way. But, but he's not, that's not his thing. He's just saying, he's like, I know you love Jesus. He's writing to the church. The, the people who are saved that belong to him. He says, I know you have a sincere mind, but you need to be reminded. Oh, the best of us. I need to be reminded of these things. You need to be reminded of these things they needed to be reminded of. I just, I just love speaking for the Lord. He says, there are some things that you may be forgetting that maybe because of the culture, they're easy to forget, easy to lose sight of. After his blistering 
denunciation of the forsaken preachers, he felt compelled by the Holy Spirit to remind the readers of this important truth that was presented by those who were false teachers as an argument. So he, he says, listen, remember, verse 2, remember the words spoken beforehand. Again, he's appealing to what they know. We see that over and over again. He's appealing to what they know. He's appealing to what we know. The word spoken beforehand by the prophets and by the apostles. It, right? there, there's a harmony between the Old Testament and the New. Some people like to separate it out. In fact, some just think that the Old Testament's not worth spending a lot of time in. That's not true. Right? The Old Testament is the foundation for the New. Now, often for new believers, we don't begin in the Old Testament. You know, the biggest mistake that a lot of new believers make is they begin in Revelation. It's like, good luck with that, right? You're just going to be confused. There's a foundation to that. You know, I always tell new believers, start in one of the Gospels. Learn, to, learn about Jesus first. And then everything else will begin to fit together. But we need the Old Testament. We need the words of the prophets. He says, God, God has spoken through the prophets, and through the apostles. The, the, the prophets of old, they spoke primarily about the Messiah to come. They were looking forward to the Messiah. They spoke about and wrote about his identity, his birth, his death, all about his earthly ministry. If you're familiar all with Isaiah 53, one of, the, one of the most profound Old Testament prophecies about Jesus, probably one of the most significant, has all the, these different details uh, of the suffering servant. It's a picture of the Messiah to come, that he'd be a suffering servant, not a conquering king in the sense of, you know, we think of conquering kings. If you're not familiar with the text, you should become familiar with it, especially if you're uncertain about the identity of Christ. Maybe if you have some questions, is Jesus really the, the Christ? Is he really the Savior? Here's just one, one verse from Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. This is a picture of the cross, where the Lamb of God suffered and died in our place, which Isaiah makes very, very clear. Here's another Old Testament prophecy that lays things out very clearly. Zechariah 9.9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. We, we know this picture, right? We, this is Palm Sunday. Jesus, Jesus fulfilled this. In the, what we call the triumphal entry, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and the people were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're, they're recognizing he's the Messiah. These things, these things were written hundreds and hundreds of years ahead of time. The study of Old Testament prophecy is so fun. Because you see these things written and they're completely fulfilled in the person of Christ. I've never, I've never personally taken up the chore of counting, but it's been said that there's as many as 300 specific prophecies that Jesus Christ in his life, his birth, life, death, and resurrection fulfilled. It's a foundation for, for the New Testament. And, and yet... There are many things that the prophets wrote about that have yet to be fulfilled. And that's kind of the point of the question that Peter is talking about here. It's about the things that are yet to come. Again, he says, the prophets wrote about these things. The word of God has been given to you. 
Here's just one. We, we recently covered this on Tuesday nights with the young men's study in Isaiah chapter 11. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Then in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. That has not happened. That has not happened. Who's the root of Jesse? Jesse is David's father. The root of Jesse is the Messiah, the son of David. That's why they call him the son of David. So it's clearly it's talking about Jesus, the Messiah. Are the nations resorting to him right now? No, they're ignoring him. Right? And that's the whole point. They're going, no, 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 no. We don't know that he's coming. We don't care. It's the problem in the world. They're ignoring him right now. It says that his resting place will be glorious. The glorious city, the glorious place is Jerusalem. This is speaking of Jesus Christ physically being on earth and ruling the world from Jerusalem. That has not happened. It's going to, though. In the same way that these other prophecies about his earthly ministry and life were fulfilled, these things are yet to be fulfilled. Peter is just saying, hey, this is what the prophets wrote about. This is all yet future. Isaiah 66, 23, it shall be from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come to bow down before me, says the Lord. Oh my, I, get, I'm, I just got chills. This is, this is part of the blessed hope that we have. Jesus Christ is coming. It's, it's not just the word of the prophets, it's the word of the apostles. Now, at the time that, that Peter has written this, you know, the, these letters were circulating. Of course, the people had received the gospel. They, they knew about the blessed hope. But then the apostles, they're, they're basically, they're putting this teaching out right now, so to speak. Even Peter's writing it. He's reminding them of the things that they've already heard about. But now it's being written down in letters so that we could have it collected here in the Bible. Paul's doing the same thing. John's doing the same thing. James doing the same thing. All writing about the same thing. The things that had happened. The things that were going to happen in the future. He says the commandment. He talks about the, he says the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. What's the commandment of the Lord? What's the commandment of Jesus? Do you guys know? It's to believe. That's the commandment. It's to believe. This is his commandment, John says. 1 John 3, 23. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Like, that's the beginning of it. And the whole idea has to do with trusting his word, believing in Jesus, and looking forward to his return. Again, as I said, Paul's letters were circulating, James' letter was circulating, all these different things. The early church knew. But they, like us, need to be reminded of the blessed hope that we have. That Jesus Christ is coming back. Now he mentions the mockers. The mockers are mocking. The scoffers. Notice that he says, first of all. First of all, why does he say that? Because it's important. I want you to remember this. This is a priority. Mockers are coming. The mockers are coming with their mock mocking and they're following after their own lusts. The original sin happened because of lust. The original sin was the setting aside of God's word for something that we delighted in that he said, no. Right? That's the origin of sin. It has to do with the delight. It has to do with something that was, was attractive to our eyes that, that Eve thought would be good. Something that was forbidden. Nothing has changed. 
Like nothing's changed. That's the original sin. That's the sin that continues. We set aside the word of God and in place we go after things that we want. That's it. It's just that simple. Oh, I think that'll be fun. God's forbid it. Eh, I'll take my chances. We roll the dice. When man rejects God's word, he gives them over to the lust. God, God lets us do what we want. Sometimes I wish he didn't, but he does. He allows you to have what you desire, whether it's good or bad. I think as Peter's writing this, and just even in, in light of the, the mockers that have come up or that are coming up, probably, and I'm reading into this a little bit, so you can take this or leave it, I think age is a factor. Peter's old, right? At, at the time of the writing of this, Peter is one of the old guys. A, a lot of times the, the false teaching appeals to a new way of thinking, a new interpretation. We don't, he keeps talking about that thing. You know, it hasn't happened. And so it's easy to write it off. And I think this is the disconnect that young people sometimes have with the things of God. Because they don't necessarily buy what the old people are selling. Younger people in the flower of youth are less concerned about the finality of things and about a future judgment. I mean, we, that's us. Like when I was a teenager, I wasn't so concerned about the end of my life. I wasn't so concerned about judgment. I wasn't so concerned about sin. I was invincible because I was young and strong. But the older I get, the more I realize I'm, I'm now closer to death than I was to birth. And I begin to sober up in the sense of realizing that my life matters. The things that I do in my life matter. The more I begin to appreciate what the scripture says. I also have a better perspective, as you guys understand. The older you get, the more you have, have a better perspective about what's going on in the world. And this is kind of the core of the argument. Is it, oh, you know. Nothing's changed. Where's his coming? You know, he's just delaying. He's an absent father. There may be a sense that Peter is just regarded as an old and outdated windbag in the mind of some. So he addresses the question. Here's the question. Where is the promise of his coming? That's what they're asking. Where is he? Where is your God? You keep talking about him. You keep talking about he's coming back. Where is he? We don't see him. It's not a sincere question. That's, that's the problem with it, is it's not really a sincere question. I think if it's a sincere question, I'm there, I want to answer that. And I hope you do too. If someone asks you that question, you know, insincerity, Explain to me about the coming of Jesus. I want to know about it. That's not the heart here. The question is not sincere. Rather, it's an accusation. And the accusation that it's, it's fantasy, it's not going to happen. Skeptics have long asked similar questions. The prophet Malachi records the question of his day, where is the God of justice? Where is your God who brings justice? Again, people, people cry that today. The psalmist writes, My tears have been my food all day and night, while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? They mocked Jesus while he was on the cross. Where is your God? Let him deliver you. Again, it wasn't sincere. Pilate asked the ultimate question in a mocking way. What is truth? He was looking truth in the eye. 
and mocking him. And so they ask this question, he's just saying, this is a, the question of, of the culture, the question of individuals in the culture. In some sense, there's some false teaching that just mocks the idea of the return of Christ. And, and they give supporting evidence. And their supporting evidence is this. Ever since the fathers fell asleep, so as far back as we can remember, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. You know, Jesus, he addressed these questions in Matthew 24 when the disciples came to him and they said, Lord, what's, what are going to be the signs of your return and the end of the age? And You know, tell us, give us the scenario. What's it going to look like? So we have this beautiful exposition in Matthew 24. I don't want to go there, but I just want to highlight some of the things that he said to be on the lookout for. He said there will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be famines and earthquakes. Persecution for the name of Christ. A great falling away. Increase of lawlessness. And love growing cold. Now you could look at that list and go, well, it's always been that way. And maybe there's been times where it seems like it's been even greater than it is today. I don't, I don't really believe that. These things have always happened in this day of man, in this church age. But my brief experience in the world is this. It's increasing. And just that one, just the idea of lawlessness. Like we've just seen it in the last two or three years. It's incredible. Just how we're just kind of going, huh? Okay. I saw this just brief video clip just the other day of just some guy driving down the street and he just happened to turn his camera on to watch a, a gang of hoodlums just bash in the window of a jewelry store and just clear out all the jewels. I mean, we're just, we're, you can see that all the time. There's no, there's no laws about shoplifting anymore. You can go into Safeway right now and load up your cart and walk out and no one's going to stop you. It's just, it's just, yeah. And we get into all the discussion about the politics behind it, but we live in a time of absolute lawlessness. And the idea of wars and rumors of wars, it's like you can't even keep track of all the different conflicts that are going on in the world. Jesus said these things are all going to be going on, and there's going to be this great falling away within the, the church, and, and just the, the idea that love grows cold. I mean, test this out. Just go have a conversation about something that's really important. You can't, we can't even discuss things anymore. Even two people who disagree, you can't have a debate. You can't have a rational discussion without like, well, you're obviously Hitler. Right? I mean, it just goes to extremes. No matter what opinion you have, it goes to extremes about everything. And I hate you, by the way. Or you're canceled. There's evidence. These things have been happening. Again, if you're an older person, you've seen a greater scope, and so you see the trend. If you're a younger person, you don't see the change so much. But it's happening. Now, as he addresses this mocking argument, he takes the mockers to school. The evidence that he uses, though he could probably use a, a, a bunch of different apologetic arguments, right? He could use a bunch of different ideas reasoning wise, but what he goes to is the root of the entire issue. He goes right to judgment because this is what the mockers are hoping to escape, like in their mind. The whole idea is they're mocking because they're people who are following the lusts of their flesh. And so their hope is that what they're mocking is not ever going to happen. That Jesus is, we don't really, we're never going to have to be responsible for who we are and how we live and what we do. They're following after their own lust. 
In 2 Peter 2.10, he says, those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires, this is who they are. This is exactly what the apostles were prophetically telling the church. Look at what Jude says in verses 17 and 18. You, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ that they were saying to you in the last time there will be mockers following after their ungodly lusts. That's their their great hope is that we're, we're going to be able to pursue whatever, we're going to be able to live however we want, do whatever we want, and there's no accountability. And that's the point of their mocking and the point of their argument. There is no accountability. And so we see their motive. We see their argument. Everything's remained the same. Nothing's changed. Where's this coming? Obviously, it's not going to happen. And so here's his response. You're not paying attention. I mean, he's right. He's, ta- he's not talking directly to them, but that's, what, that's in essence what he's saying. He says it's escaped their It's escaped their notice. Here's some things that they're not thinking about that they're not paying attention to. That that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Verses 5 and 6. It escapes their notice. Now, the New American Standard translates that phrase, it escapes their notice, this is where one of the rare instances where you hear me say, that's not, I don't think that's the best translation of the language. It's a difficult phrase, obviously, to translate. King James translates it this way, for this they willingly are ignorant. There is a sense about it that we need to understand that it's not just, oops, we forgot about that. It's that they willfully have ignored it. It's something that they know, something that is known, that they do not want to believe or do not want to remember. The literal Greek language is, for this escapes them being willing. Again, you can see why it's it's a clumsy phrase to, to try to translate. It escapes them, but they're willing that it escapes them. It's the same idea that Paul articulates in Romans chapter 1 where he says, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. The same idea. It's that which is known about God, that which is known about his word, we're willing, we're, we're willing in a sense to just set it aside and say, well, I don't really think about that. I'm not concerned with that. It's not important. No, we're not going to pay attention. And so he gives this reminder. Again, it's something that they know. God created the heavens and the earth. He makes that really clear. He affirms Genesis. He affirms actually the third day of creation when the earth was separated from the waters. And so so the whole idea is for some 1,650 years, the earth remained in the condition in which God created it until the flood. And he says, well, then God intervened. He says, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. So remember that? Yeah, there was a long period of time where the earth remained in one condition, but then at a certain time, God intervened. He flooded the entire thing. Remember that. Judgment came. The reader would have known this. The the people of the day would have known this. It was common knowledge. They knew the word that he was referring to here. He's appealing to them to remember that which they are trying to ignore or forget. They knew the reason for judgment. We want to forget that, right? Especially in our culture where we celebrate the rainbow, but we forget what happened. <laughs> right? We, 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 we celebrate the promise that God says he'll never destroy the world again with water. But we forget the reason why there was a flood. 
It says in Genesis 6, 5 and 6, the Lord saw the wickedness of man. It was great on the earth. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So, and I just, I hate this verse. Because the Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth. And he was grieved in his heart. The whole idea there is it's one of those things that's an anthropomorphism. It it could be said that God repented. It's not that he didn't know what he was doing, but this is speaking to the fact that his heart was broken. Because the people that he loved were just living in a state of absolute rebellion and absolute rejection of him. And so judgment needed to come. He took action. He's reminding them. They know this. He's reminding them of this. And you know, we need to be reminded, as Jesus told us in Matthew 24, 37, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. It's like, it's so important for us to to understand that. What's it going to be like? It's going to be like that. In the last days, things will be utterly sinful. People will be willfully, again, that's the idea, willfully ignoring God, willfully going against His Word, willfully just going about their business as though nothing was wrong and no judgment was coming. La, 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 la. That's what's happening today. Judgment's coming. As he says in verse 7, by his word, again, you see the idea of his word over and over and over again. The original sin was the rejection of his word. The ongoing sin was the rejection of his word. The, 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 The argument of the false teachers was a rejection of his word. And by his word, he's pronounced judgment's coming. By his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Now, we're going to talk more about the destruction of the earth next week. He's going to go into great details about that. But again, notice his word all through this. It was by his word that the world was created. It's by his word that judgment came. It's by his, it's his word that's being willfully ignored. Again, this is something that's in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Malachi says, behold, the day is coming. Behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and evildoers will be chaffed. The day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts. So that it will leave them neither root or branch. He's talking about judgment. He's talking about destruction on who? On on sinners. On unrepentant sinners. The evildoers. The arrogant. God is a righteous judge. We don't don't necessarily like this in the sense of, you know, it's, it's not fun to dwell on this topic. But here it is. God is a righteous judge. And because he's a righteous judge, he must punish sin. And there is a day set aside for that judgment. Jesus said, he who rejects me, he who rejects me and does not receive my saying, has one who judges him. The word that I spoke will judge him at the last day. Again, you got the prophet saying it. You've got Jesus himself saying it. You've got the apostles writing about it. There's a day of judgment that awaits mankind. Now we might ask, why, why must God judge? Why has he got to be so judgy? I mean, people say that in general about you and I. Why, you gotta be so, why does there have to be so many rules? Why does he have to be so judgy? This has to do with his nature. I think, I think, again, especially in our culture, we, we just dumb everything down. We're not talking about a superhero. 
And he's not a man. He's God. And even the question, why does he have to be this? Or why does he have to? It's, it's, it's really nonsense. It's his nature. God is holy. God is other. God's not like us. He's different than us. I think sometimes we spend so much time worshiping the human form. God's different than us. He's the only one worthy of worship. He's other. And he cannot approve evil. Habakkuk 1 tells us this. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil. You cannot look on wickedness with favor. One might ask, couldn't he just ignore our sin? Couldn't he just wink? Couldn't he just give us a pass? There are a lot of parents like that. How do their children turn out? If you don't discipline your children, how do you expect your children are going to turn out? I'll tell you. No one's going to like them. Their teachers won't like them. Their bosses won't like them. Their spouses won't like them. Discipline is a gift. The purpose of God's judgment is to help us grow up. Hebrews 12 tells us that God's discipline is love. It says in verse 10, He disciplines us for our good so that we may share in His holiness. It's like He disciplines us and there's judgment in our lives so that we can actually come close to Him. The, the purpose is to remove sin. To so remove sin and to remove the subsequent guilt. Because it's our sin that separates us from Him. Right? From the beginning, sin separates us from a holy God. And that sin must be dealt with. It must be paid for. It must be atoned for. And all of humanity, even us at times, we're, we're like a criminal who thinks we can outrun the long arm of the law. That given enough time, Right? And enough pretending and enough distractions that somehow it'll all go away. Somehow that we'll never have to face justice. And so he goes on with the argument. And really this is a reply to the argument. He says, here's something that I want you to have in your brain, church. Verse 8 do not let this one fact escape your notice. Don't forget this. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. Now that's not a formula. Like a lot of guys, they look at that and they go, oh, you know, that's a formula. And so we can interpret the millennium to be something different and all that. It's not a formula. Here's what he's saying, is that God lives outside of time. He doesn't count time like you and I do. I like to say it this way, he reads the book all at once. We turn the page. We can only get to what's next by turning the page. He knows what's on the next page. He knows it all, all together, all at once. He exists outside of what we understand as time. And so that's all he's saying, because the, 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 the complaint is, where is he? It's taking so long. He's definitely not coming. It's been thousands of years. Where is your God? Don't forget this. One day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like one day. He's not, he doesn't have a clock like you do. And then, and then he gives us the reason the reason for the delay. This is one of the most beautiful verses. It's intimidating to even look at because it's like, it, it's so beautiful. The Lord is not slow. The Lord is not slow about His promises. Some count slowness, but He's patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Oh, it is so glorious. It's so beautiful. The promise is the promise that God has made. The promise is that somehow we could return 
to that relationship that we formerly had, that we could walk with God. Again, again, not a superhero, not a man, the God of the universe that Adam and Eve at one point had a relationship with that was severed because of sin. Now the hope is that one day we could be brought back into relationship, even physically, with the God of the universe. This is glorious. That's the promise. It's the promise of eternal life in Him. All the world, all the world wants that in one way or another, right? He's just saying, this is what God wants. He wants you to have what was lost. When you look back at the original story of the, the fall of Adam and Eve, it's, it's so interesting. There's so many details to it. Originally, they had access to the tree of life. Humanity is still searching for the tree of life, right? We, we want some herb or some thing that we could just eat and it'd be the magic pill to live forever. This is that. There, there was a, a tree of life and they had access to the tree of life. Unfortunately, they chose the tree of good and evil. When they sinned, they were banned forever from the tree of life. But then we read in Revelation 22, guess what props back, pops back up? The tree of life, whose leaves are, are for the healing of the nations. I, I'll just have to admit, I don't understand that, but I want to eat its fruit. It's something that God intended for His people that we lost, and it has to do with life. It has to do with even with eternal life banned in the garden because of the fall, but restored, access restored in the last days. This is what God wants for us. And this is the idea that we would live with Him forever. Why does He delay? Because He wants you to live with Him forever. Turn over to John 14. John chapter 14. Again, these are just glorious verses. Of course, in Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about what the conditions of the world will be like uh, after he leaves and before he returns. In John 14, uh, similarly, he's talking to the disciples about what's about to happen. He's about to die. He's going to go away. And, and he knows that his children are going to have great concerns. And so he says these most wonderful, most beautiful words. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. Okay, that, that, are you kidding me? Don't be troubled. I'm going away. I'm going to be doing something. When I'm going away, I'm making a place for you. Mm, that sounds good. I want to move in. I don't, I don't know what all that's going to be like, but it's the Lord. I'm going to make a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. What's his intention? What's God's intention? That we be with him. Like you're mocking. You're saying, oh, where, where is this coming? When's he coming? What's the deal? Why is this delay? He's doing something, and his intention is that we would one day be with him. Thomas Accord, Accord you know, he says, um, and you know the way where I'm going? Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? Good question. I think it was a sincere question from Thomas. And the Lord says, Here's, you know the way. I'm the way. I'm the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. I'm going away. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to come and get you. How do we get there? Believing in Jesus Christ. That's it. He's the way. Here's why God delays. Because he loves you. 
I'm assuming as I'm looking out at the church, there's no skeptics here. But maybe somebody watching this online, you're going, yeah. What? If, you, if you're a skeptic, here's the answer to the question. Why does God delay? Because he loves you. I'm thankful that he's delayed this far. I'm thankful that he at least delayed till 1987. When I gave my life to Christ and my eternal security was in hand. He wants us to be in relationship with himself. He wants to give us eternal life. And not just us, but the world. Whoever, whosoever would put their faith in him. That's why he delays. It says in 1 Timothy 2.4, He desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's why he's waiting. He's patient. He's not counting time like you count time. He's patient, and he's waiting for people to come to a saving faith in him. God loves you. God wants you to live forever with him. This is the gospel. I mean, the answer to the question is the gospel. Whenever anyone asks you, where, where is, when is Jesus coming? Why is it taking so long? It's because he's waiting for you. It's because he loves you. I always think in terms of evangelism, I can't wait. Let's get the last one. Let's go find the last one so we can get out of here. <laughs> Seriously. Because we have this great commission to go and share the good news, the hope of the gospel. God loves you. He wants you to, have, to live with him forever. Again, our sin has caused a separation between us and him. God created a way for that penalty, that sin to be paid. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for sin. You don't have to pay the penalty. Like that, that, that is the, the thing with this judgment that's coming. That's the world. The unbelieving world is going to pay the penalty for their own sin in eternal destruction. And God says, I gave you my son. If you would believe in him, he died to take that away. But you must believe in him. We must repent. We must repent of our unbelief and put our hope in Jesus Christ. Salvation is by faith. It began with the word of God. It ends with the word of God. In John 1.12, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God even to those who believe in his name. What a great word this is. I hope you're trusting in him today. If you're not, put your faith in Jesus Christ. Ask him to forgive you your sins. There's repentance is prescribed here. Turn. Turn from your unbelief. Put your faith in him. And then, for all of us who are, are, are looking for him, Hold on to the blessed hope. This is the great doctrine of Jesus' return. He's coming. All these scriptures will one day be fulfilled. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's a word of hope. It's a word of your love. It's a word of the gospel. Lord, we want to hold on to you. We want to hold on to the doctrine of your imminent return. It's not far off. In the meantime, Lord, I pray that we would be busy, busy as a church, busy as individual believers, that on your return, we'll be found working, we'll be found active, looking, looking for those who would believe in Jesus Christ. Use us, Lord, in that way for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.